Henry Blackaby uh, is a man that I, I really value. Um, uh, he, he actually has written a book called Experiencing God. And, and I recommend it to you. He and his son have actually done a revision of that book. And they've got a number of different studies that are out on the book, Experiencing God. It's really a classic. And, and Blackaby talks about the work that God has done and how God wants us to, in, to join him in his work. In fact, Blackaby actually felt that God had called him to plant churches across Canada. He was a Southern Baptist pastor and, 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 and young guy, and he said, you know, just believe that God had given him a vision. There are a variety of things behind that story, why God had sent him out to plant churches in Canada. <laughs> the funny thing was, the first church he went to was a small, dying church that couldn't even afford to pay him a salary. He, but, but Henry Blackaby had this belief that if you watch what God's doing and you respond to what God's doing, God will bless it. So he gets to this church, and a short time after he's arrived, a car drives up with some men from another town. They come up to Blackaby and say, Blackaby, we hear that you are here to plant churches in Canada, and we want you to come plant the church in our community, something like 75 miles away. And, and Henry's thinking like, okay, they can't even afford my salary here, and they want our church to plant another church in another town 75 miles away. But he said, you know what? If somebody's coming like that, I'm, I'm going to listen and see if this was what God's leading us to do. So he goes to that other community. They have some meetings and meet some people in the town. They invite people to gather together. And there's one lady in the back of the room, and they say, so, so do you want to have a church here? This so one lady stands up starts crying. She said, I've been praying for something like 45 years for a new Baptist church to come into town. Another man gets up and says, I've been praying for the last 35 years for that same thing. And pretty soon the whole movement is, and the church starts, and it's even bigger than the church that has sent Henry over there to plant them. So now he's planting two churches. And the stories just go on and on like that with Blackaby, where he sees God doing something, and he responds to it, and God blesses. In fact, he's raised millions of dollars, started many ministries and all um, across Canada and in the United States. Um, and all because he tries to listen and see what God's doing and respond to that. Which is really what we're talking about this morning. We're in a series on trying to discern God's will. And it's interesting because it relates to this whole thing of, should we buy that corner property down there or not? It, does God want us to have that kind of a foothold on Lake Drive? Does God want us to do the kind of ministry that would need to happen on that corner with music groups and coffee and an environment of community and all that? Does God want us to do that? And we're trying to discern God's will. By the way, did, did you hear how I found out about the coffee company that was for sale? No. Uh -uh. <laughs> Joseph Kadikamo, the pastor of New Wine, calls me up one day and he says, Bill, I was in Goodwin's just a, mo a few minutes ago, standing behind a girl who was talking to one of the cashiers, and they were discussing the fact that she was going to have to sell the coffee company. Really? Sell the coffee company? Yeah, and, and so, so I, I actually, Joseph said, he said, I actually interrupted their conversation. So, so you're selling the coffee at the Lake Great Great Coffee Company? And then and, and the girl said, uh, yeah, who are you and why are you <laughs> interrupting our conversation? Well, you were talking right out loud. I mean, I couldn't help but hear what you were saying. Well, it turns out that that was Eric's girlfriend, Army, who works at Goodwins, who was here. And he had come and just told me that. The next day was when I actually called Bill up, the owner of the coffee house, and said, Bill, um, could I meet with you? I'd like to hear what's happening. Uh, that morning, I'd also learned about the cannabis and, and how the, the people were getting upset about the cannabis on the patio and so things. And so I, okay, well, this is an interesting time for me to go and just see him. It's just amazing. God does give information about his will to us if we will listen. And as, if we will listen, then he invites us to be partners with him and to be involved with him in his work. 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 Yeah. This is a, this is a Blackaby's um, graph, if you will. It's a it's a picture of what God tries to do in our lives. Ultimately, God's at work, and He invites us to be a part of His work. And that's that arrow going across the top there. On the far right side, then it says is actually the final step, and that's obey and experience. 
In order to get to obey and experience, for us to experience God's work in our lives, number one, we've got to acknowledge and see and look for what God's doing. Number two, God invites us into a personal relationship with Him. With him. God loves us. Isn't that what we've just been celebrating in communion this morning? That, that God loves us so much that He invites us to become His personal friend. He invites us into this personal relationship. This is not about re religion, is it? But, but Jesus says, look, I want to know you and have you know me. I want to walk with you and have you walk with me. I want this personal relationship with you. I want to take care of your sin by my sacrifice. And he's inviting us into that relationship. Then thirdly, is with, once we have that relationship, then guess what God does? He says, okay, good. Now that you're in a relationship with me, I've got some things that I want to do. And I want you to join me in what I'm doing. He gives us an invitation to join him in his work. Every Christian who comes to become a follower of Jesus Christ is invited to be a light of the world, is invited to, be, to do the ministry of reconciliation, is invited to be a part of sharing in God's work around the world. With that, then, God often speaks to us, and he may speak specific things. He may say, go to your neighbor. In fact, this morning, God spoke to Debbie about a different Nathaniel, Nathaniel. <laughs> And so there's a car out across the street, and the uh, guy's got a flat tire. And Nathaniel had left a little note on my dad or, or at the office and saying, you know, please don't pull my car away. I'm sleeping in my car. I'm living in my car. Uh, please don't you know, have it towed. I can't afford that. And now he's got a flat tire. So, so Debbie looks, she sees the car out there and says, Bill, is it okay if I get him breakfast? Oh, no, no. We don't want to give people breakfast. No. <laughs> And so I said, sure, get him breakfast. So she goes, gets him breakfast, then she gets a couple of water bottles. We go out there to the car. He's not there. <laughs> now what do you do? We, we become, well, so a moment later, dip, 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 Bill, he's back, he's back. Okay, so we go out and give him. Guess what? As soon as I walked up to him, you know what Nathaniel did? He started giving me a big hug. Just gave me a big hug. I haven't even given him the food or the water. I just I said, but my wife had to, wanted me to give you something, and he's give, give me a big hug. And he get second time after giving that, okay, give me another hug because you gotta go give your wife a hug too. It's a young guy, Nathaniel is probably about your guy's age, incidentally. <laughs> so and he, he's out there, he's living in his car. Uh, and by the way, Nathaniel may come later for lunch because we have a coffee meal today, and I invited him to come. And notice I didn't require him to be at worship. Because God speaks to us and God invites us then to join him. And when he speaks, he actually may speak specific things. Take that breakfast over there and just show him some love. That's what God wants us to do. Well, it also then, after that, and this is the one we'll be talking about in two weeks, the crisis of belief. God tells us to do something, and then what happens? Not me. <laughs> Surely, God, you're speaking to the wrong person. <laughs> Get somebody else over there. <laughs> I'm not going across that street. I'm not going to talk to that person. Oh, my God. It, kind of like Moses, right? You all know Moses was a stutterer. So, he, so he's like, you know, I, 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 I can't talk. So, no, you've got to get somebody else, God. You know, it didn't matter that he'd been trained in the school of the Pharaoh. He's still, no, I can't do that, God. And we all come to a point when God tells us to do something, we come to a place of a crisis of belief. Are we going to act? Are we going to do what he said? Sixth thing is then adjust. <laughs> and guess who needs to adjust? Normally, we think it's God. Because if you really check out your prayers, when, you're tell when God's telling you to do something, and you're trying to discern what you should, guess what you tend to do? You tell God how to figure things out. Right? You, I mean, you lay out the plan for Him. Don't you? Come on, be honest. How many of you? Don't we kind of have a thank you? <laughs> Don't we kind of say, God, this is the way I think you ought to do things. Because obviously we know more about our lives than God does, right? I mean, he's just the creator of the universe. What would he know about me? And, and there's a challenge. It's a crisis of belief. It's a crisis. Are we going to follow through in what God has said to do or not? But when we do, when we obey, that steps up, then we experience God's blessing. Then we experience what God has been to accomplish through us. That's when cool things happen, folks. It's when we're doing what God has said and what he wants us to do, not him doing what we want him to do. So that's the graph. That's just a reminder. That's kind of the, it's a, it's a visual for you to see. This is what we're going through in our series on trying to discern God's will. 
Well, this morning we're going to look specifically at the life of Moses. I've mentioned him now once or twice already. We're going to look at the life of Moses. We're going to look at Exodus chapter 3, verses 1 to 10. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight. Why the bush does not burn up? When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals for the place where you are standing is holy. Moses has been working for as a shepherd for now 40 years. He's now nearly 80 years old. 40 years earlier, he had been raised in Pharaoh's household, and he had become a murderer of an Egyptian. Why? Because he had seen this Egyptian abusing an Israelite, a Jew, and he didn't like that. And so he thought, I'm going to do something about this. I've got power. And he steps in, and he kills the Egyptian. With that, Pharaoh doesn't like it. And Pharaoh goes after him and wants to have him killed himself. He's going to get vengeance for, for what Moses has done wrong. See, Moses has long since given up his aspirations for setting the, the Jews free. He maybe thought about it at one time, like I said, when he saw that man. Because he had gone out to actually kind of survey the life of the Jews. And he saw this evil taking place. And so he kills this man. But unknown to Moses, God's been working behind the scenes, even before Moses was born. Some of you might remember the rest of the story. And Moses was born at a time that Pharaoh saw, thought that the Jews were growing too large and too powerful, and there were too many of them all around, and so they needed to limit them. And so they started saying they started killing all of the little baby boys, so that there wouldn't be growth. You know, they might have the girls; they just can kill all the little baby boys. In that environment, Moses was born. His mother took care of him for a couple of months until he got too big and too noisy. And then she said, now we've got to do something different. She and her, and her daughter created a basket, put that basket in the water. She sent her daughter down to watch what happened to the basket. Wouldn't you know it, but the day that they put the basket in the water, a mere coincidence occurs. And the basket floats downstream right in front of Pharaoh's daughter, who's not married, doesn't have children, and her, her, her girls that are there with her. She asks a couple of girls, go get that basket, let's see what's in it. They pull it up, they see it's a baby. They even recognize that it's a Jewish baby, but, and it's a Jewish baby boy. But Pharaoh's daughter decides, oh, this is now gonna be my son. And so she takes him into her household and she raises him. Well, when you know it, but Miriam's over there watching. Well, Miriam's over there. Hey, hey, Miriam, hey, hey, you know what? I know a lady who could nurse him and take care of him for you. Oh, do you really? Well, good, get her for me. And so she goes back and her mom. Here, here, my mom will take care of him and really, you know, guide him and do all things necessary. And literally she nurses him. A baby who should have been killed. Who will now grow up in Pharaoh's household who will get the best training of, of the day. All kinds of experiences and blessings that he will gain because he is now brought in as a son of Pharaoh. <clears throat> It's interesting, but he gets the training that he will need later to lead Israel out of bondage. God is at work behind the scenes even when we don't know it. Incidentally, who delivered the children of Israel from Egypt? God. Not Moses. You think about it, when, when Moses was trying to deliver them, what happened? He failed. Well, look at the story of Exodus 2, 11 to 15. One day after Moses had grown up, he went out to where his own people were and watched them at their hard labor. He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his own people. Glancing this way and that, and seeing no one, he killed the Egyptian and hit him in the sand. The next day he went out and saw two Hebrews fighting. He asked the one in the wrong, why are you hitting your fellow Hebrew? The man said, who made you ruler and judge over us? Are you thinking of killing me as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and thought, 
what I did must have become known. When Pharaoh heard of this, he tried to kill Moses, but Moses fled from Pharaoh and went to live in Midian, where he sat down by a well, and that's where he meets Midian the priest. That's where his life changes and he becomes a shepherd. Moses failed as a deliverer. He tried to use his own training, his own ingenuity, his own abilities to free the people. Not only did he murder men, but the Jews didn't even want his help. <laughs> You're going to do just what you did to the Egyptian? We don't want you here. Even when he comes back later, we don't want you to lead us out of here. You're just going to leave us alone, Moses. We don't want anything to do with you. They didn't want his pampered, affluent, aristocratic uh, lifestyle. And in fact, you think about this. If Moses had followed through with his methods, what would he have done? Well, he would have started a war against the Egyptian soldiers. These were some of the, the most mighty soldiers of the day. The, the, the Jews were unarmed. And sure, how many Jews would have died? By the way, do you know how many Jews died with the Exodus? Not one. Not only did no Jews die, but when they left, when they left Egypt, they left with gold and silver and other wealthy things that the people begged them to take with them. So that they, they took they took the pillage from the community that the community begged them to take because they wanted to get rid of them. But if Moses had done it when he was a young man, who knows how many. Jews would have died and would they have gotten free. See, God wants us to be partners with him. In Exodus 3, verses 6 and following, he says, Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go, I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. What does he say? I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I have been forever. I am alive. And I've heard the cries of my people. And I've come. I've come to rescue them. He's heard the, the kind of pain that they're going through. He's heard the kinds of spiritual attack that they're involved with. And that's not familiar. He's heard what's going on in our lives. And he's come to rescue us. See, see what's happened is God, God saying, God has seen the need. God's aware of our needs too, isn't he? Not just the, Egypt, the, the, the Jews, but God's aware of our needs. God knows what's going on in our life. God cares about our hurts and our heartaches and our challenges, our difficulties. God cares about the spiritual battle that we might be facing. God knows you and cares about you. <laughs> this is an interesting one. God wants Moses to do the work. God wants Moses to do the work. Just like God enlists people today to do his will. We are his arms, his hands, his feet. We're, we're, we're able to put our arms around somebody who's grieving because God enables us to do that. We're able to encourage somebody who's sad or in despair because God enables us to do that. We're the one who maybe comes alongside and through our prayers helps lift somebody up because the Holy Spirit anoints and empowers us to do that. God invites us to join him in his work. Notice here also, you don't find Moses saying, okay, God, you need to bless me and, uh, and bless me to set these people free. No, it's God saying, Moses, let's talk. Let's talk about how we can together set these people free. It's not us asking God to do our will. It's God asking us to join him in doing his will. Moses already tried to do the work on his own, as I mentioned, and one of the biggest mistakes we can make is trying to do God's work in our abilities. 
trying to serve the Lord in our own strength. And that can happen in any position in ministry in the church camp, where we're simply trying to serve God by our ability. And you know what happens when you do that? You burn out. You wear out. And then finally, God has been at work behind the scenes. And it's been amazing. God, as I've already pointed out, God was at work back there before he was born. He's been working through the 40 years that he was in Pharaoh's house. And he worked through the 40 years that he was out shepherding. And he was learning a whole different thing, wasn't he? And he had actually reached a point where he's like, okay, I'm done with all that Pharaoh stuff and all that Egypt stuff. And I'm just out here enjoying these sheep. <laughs> and the fire in the bush that's burning over there, that, how's it not burning? Hmm. Then it's an exciting day for him because he sees a fire. I mean, what, what else can you do when you're watching sheep? They just sit there, right? Sheep. They're there. And so, so now there's something exciting. So come on, sheep. We're walking over there. We're see what's out over there burning in that bush. God's been at work behind the scenes even when we don't think he is. Amen. Even when we don't see it. So my question this morning is how can you and I get involved in what God's doing? Well, one of the things is we need to know what God has already called us to do. And every Christian has already been called to be a part of what the Bible refers to as the ministry of reconciliation. Every one of us has a responsibility, once we know Jesus Christ, to share Jesus Christ's love with somebody else. That's a responsibility. In fact, not just a responsibility, it's a privilege. And God will equip us to do that if we'll simply be obedient. But can we just be honest about something for a minute? Too many of us are making excuses for sharing God's love with somebody else. Now, how come I didn't get a whole bunch of amens with that one? <laughs> because it just made me a little bit too home. Too close to home. We make excuses. We think we don't know enough. We, we, we don't have enough information. Well, I can't convince them. Guess what? It's not your job to convince anybody. It's your, not your job to convict anybody. It's not your job to make anybody feel guilty. It's like, a, oh, yes, thank you for making me feel, feel so bad. Now I'm going to accept Jesus Christ. It's not your job. Please quit trying to do that, in fact. What is your job? When God gives you an appointment, keep it. When God says, go stand next to that person, or like Debbie this morning, go give Nathaniel something to eat, then what should you do? Go. No. Oh, no, you should get out four spiritual laws. You should get out ten traps. You should take it over and Before I give you this food, you need to read these things, right? No, no, you do what he says. Go serve. Go love. Go do what God has done for you. So how, are we, how do we get involved? Well, 2 Corinthians 5, 15 to 21 says this. That first off, we all have this. And he died for all. That those who live should no longer live for themselves. That's where it begins, isn't it? Nobody's selfish here, right? Tap your neighbor and say, are you the one who's selfish? <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> All those who live should no longer live for themselves. Wouldn't churches be a lot different if we all followed this one little practice? <laughs> if we did live for ourselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. Jesus said, look, I died for you, now live for me, not for yourself. He goes on. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. All this is from God. Now watch, now watch. Who reconciled us to himself through Christ. But there's an end. The word chi in the Greek. There's a, he reconciled us and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Oh, wait a second. He didn't just, didn't just save me so I could be happy? No, he saved me so I could be happy and be set free and help set somebody else free. And he gave us the ministry of reconciliation. And then in case you're wondering what that is, he says that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not, that's, this is rocket reconciliation, not counting people's sins against them. Anybody have your sin this week? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We can join the kind of crowd. We've all sinned, right? He says, look, God no longer counts our sins against us, but he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. That's cool, isn't it? 
God is talking to people how? Through us. God's voice. Literally, you, you can become God's voice. You can speak on his behalf as you're helping people to know that God no longer wants to count their sins against them. We implore you on Christ's behalf. Be reconciled to God. Get it right with him. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And when you understand that, the guilt and the shame is gone and there's a freedom that, that no one can take from you because you've been set free by the blood of the Lamb of God. So what does he say? Don't live for yourself. Don't view people from a worldly point of view. You're a brand new creation. You've been reconciled to God. If you've accepted his payment, what he did for you, you've been given now this ministry of reconciliation, and God wants to talk to other people, make his appeal through you. And then he's just going to send you out there and make you do it on your own, right? <laughs> Sometimes that's what we think. God speaks when he is about to accomplish his purposes. It's been 80 years that Moses has been waiting. <laughs> he didn't even know what he was waiting for. He's taking care of sheep. But God has decided, it's now time, Moses. Now you're going to set the people free. Now I'm going to invite you to be a part of my task, my ministry. What should you do when God shows you his will? Run, right? <laughs> Head out of there the other way, right? When, when God shows you his will, you need to respond by action, by doing what he says. He speaks when he accomplishes his purposes. And that's true throughout scripture. Now keep in mind, the results of what God is doing may be a, a long time off, right? 80 years for Moses. Remember how long it was from the time that Abraham told was told he was going to have a son? 25 years. 25 years they waited. Uh, God, I'm 75 right now. 76, Lord. I think I'm getting old. My wife, when, they, when he gets to be 100, do you remember how old, how old Sarah is? <laughs> okay. God, I think she's a little bit past the child rearing days. Lord, don't you think? <laughs> 25 years later, they give birth to their son. But when should you respond? When God comes to you, respond. Somebody walked up to me yesterday as I was out there for the parade. She, she walks up and says, Bill, are you guys buying the coffee company, the coffee house? Well, um, it's in escrow. We're trying to see. We're going to vote on that. Oh, yeah. oh we're so excited. We're so excited. You know how many people I've been getting those kinds of comments from? It's just interesting. The fact that Joseph Kavikamo calls me up and says, Bill, it's for sale. Really, Joseph? Yeah, you need to do something about it. I have no idea to be interested, Joseph. <laughs> and then the other day when I saw him again, Bill, are you, are you buying it? You, this is, you guys need to do that. It's just interesting. When God speaks, God wants us to respond and to be obedient to him. What God initiates, by the way, God completes. When God says to do something, he will give you the resources to do what he wants us to do. Isaiah said it's something like this. Uh, yes, I have spoken, so I will bring it about. I have planned it. I will also do it. Who's the I? God. God saying, look, if I set up a plan and I've got something I want you to do, I will do it. Isaiah 46, 10, 11, excuse me. In fact, let's look at that whole text. It says, begin at verse 8, it says, Remember this, keep it in mind, take it to heart, you rebels. <laughs> None of us here, right? <laughs> See, all right. Keep it, uh, take it to heart, you rebels. Remember the former things, those of long ago. I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. Amen. I make known the end from the beginning, from ancient times, what is still to come. God is revealing his purposes. He wants us to know his will. He goes on to say, I say, my purpose will stand and I will do all that I please. God is going to accomplish what he wants to accomplish. Now, really, what we kind of have the question is, are we going to join him or are we going to kind of try to fight him? Because God's going to accomplish his purposes. 
Moses tried to fight him for a bit, you know. Send somebody else. I can't do it. I can't talk. I can't talk. You know. I don't want to be that guy. Moab, and then, even the, even as the children of Israel later complain, God, why did you put me in as the leader of these people? Although then he will find himself, he's fallen in love with them. And, okay, God, please, I, I repent and don't kill them. <laughs> just a few. Just get rid of the noisy ones. But no, okay, God. Forgive them all. <laughs> and he begs, he begs, and pleads on behalf of these people that are obnoxious. God said, my purpose will stand and I will do all that I please. From the east I summon a bird of prey. From a far off land a man to fulfill my purpose. Look, he's saying, look, I use all of nature. I accomplish my purposes. From what I have said, that I will bring about. What I have planned, that I will do. Listen to me, you stubborn-hearted. <laughs> who is he talking to you about here? Rebel, stubborn-hearted? I don't know who he's speaking to them. Who, you who are now far from my righteousness. I am bringing my righteousness near. It is not far away, and my salvation will not be delayed. I will grant salvation to Zion, my splendor to Israel. Oh, Lord, God wants to do some special things if we'll let him do it through us. Let him do it through us. Let him do it through us. Well, then he'll do it through someone else. Don't look for God to bless you. Frequently, I think that we, the reason we don't join God in, is that we're committed we want him to join us. We want God to bless us, not to work through us. And as a church, don't look for how God's going to bless us. Look for how God is going to reveal himself by working through you and, and beyond you to accomplish his purposes. What should you do when you see God doing something? Join him. Respond by getting involved with what he's doing. Philippians 2, 12 to 13 says this, Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. By the way, just a quick note there, he's not saying, look, you've got to work for salvation. But he's saying, look, because you're saved, it ought to show itself in action. Like James says as well. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purposes. God's at work. Are you following what he's doing? By the way, do you know how to find, and I'm going to give you five steps. Steps to identify God's activity. Ready? How are we going to discern what God's will is? How are we going to determine the steps that we ought to be taking as a church, as individuals? Well, here's five simple things you could do. Number one, when you know what God is doing around you, when you want to know what God is doing around you, guess what you want to do? Pray. Pray. It begins there. Talk to him. God, what are you doing in Crestline? Have you noticed Crestline's changing? The mountain's going through some transitions. Uh, just, just things are happening up here. And is it good or bad? I don't know. <laughs> but it's changing. What is God doing? What if God's orchestrating the changes that are happening? Even if we don't like them, what if God's the one orchestrating those changes? It's number one, ask him, pray, God. What are you doing? And it's not a, God, what are you doing? It's, God, I'm really interested. I want to know what you're doing in our world right now. Secondly, is when you pray a prayer like that, what should you do? Actually, I have another step before listen. What you should do is watch. When you pray a prayer like, God, what are you doing in our community? God, what are you doing right here this morning? God, what are you doing in our church? God, what are you doing in this neighborhood? Then what should you do? Open your eyes and watch and see what happens next. So if God leads somebody to come talk to you, you better be listening and say, why is this person talking to me? What are they talking about? And, and now then you move to number three, which is make the connection between your prayer and what the events that occur next. So we've been praying for God's will for this church, haven't we? Isn't it kind of interesting how different things have been happening and coming along? Like, like Mountain Hope, 
giving us $2,500 to help buy it. Jack Hamilton giving us $500 this week. There should be others like that. God's doing something. When you pray for God's will, be ready to respond when you see things happening after you prayed that prayer. Unless you prayed the prayer, but you didn't really want him to answer. Okay? If, if you don't want to know what God's doing, then why even waste the time asking him? Fourth, ask questions and listen. Ask questions and listen. When God brings somebody to you, ask questions and listen to them. Too much of our, even our witnessing is all about us telling somebody something. When what we really need to be doing is talking, asking them questions, learning about them, listening to them. It's really as we listen that we earn the right to share. So I was talking to somebody this week that says, you know, I've been listening to all my friends for quite a long time. And she said, um, I realize that I've never, I've never shared. I listen to all their beliefs and all their different thoughts about life and everything, and I've never shared. I said, AJ, maybe it's time now for you to go ahead and share, because now you've earned the right to share, because you listen. Ask questions and listen attentively as people share their concerns. And number five, be ready to make whatever adjustments are required to join God in what he is doing. Are you ready to make those adjustments? God's showing you his will. God's inviting you to be part of a partner with him in his ministry. Are you ready to adjust your life so that you can do his will? Because that is when, and we'll talk about this again, that's when we come to a crisis of belief. Will I act on what God shows me? Let's pray. God. I think it's a really cool time that we're in as a, as a church, uh, and I hope it's true for uh, individuals that are here today, too, that, that Lord, that, that, that they would even sense that, Lord, that you've made a divine appointment for each person to be here this morning. And you're calling us to be partners with you, to be a part of what you're doing in our world. I thank you for that, God. And I pray that every single individual here today would understand that this appointment was something orchestrated by you and there's things that you're trying to say to them in their life, wherever they're at, wherever they're doing. God, help us to now see your activity in our community, in our individual settings, wherever we're at, in the house we're living, in the neighborhood we're at, the job we're on, Whatever we're doing, God, help us to see what you are doing. And I pray for the courage and the surrender to do it your will. <laughs> Lord, can't wait to see what happens as, as we do things to obey you and to follow you and to go wherever you're going and to see you at work. Oh, God, I, I look forward to hearing the stories and for you to receive the glory. And just before I end this prayer, just a question for each one of you. Have you admitted your need for Jesus Christ? I mean, you may have been a Christian a long time, maybe you've been in church for a long time, but, but have you admitted your need for him again? Have you allowed yourself to get stale? As Jesus said, have you forgotten your first love? And if so, do you need to make a new commitment to say, I want to pursue what God wants? Obviously, if you don't have that personal relationship with him, I invite you to say yes. He's saying, I love you. I want you to be my child. I paid for you on the cross. Please accept my love. And if you haven't accepted that love, I encourage you to accept it today. You say, well, I'm not good enough. To tell you. Yeah, you're right. Well, what, what do I have to do to earn it? Nothing. You can't. You can't earn it. You need to accept it. And then believe that he died for you. And then commit yourself to following him. It really is, like some pastors have said, as simple as A, B, C. you need to do that today. Say yes and tell somebody else 
person seated next to you, I just said yes to Jesus. Tell them. Come tell me I'll be at the door. Tell somebody on the worship team. Tell somebody else. And by the way, if today you're saying, I need to, I've been getting lazy with my relationship with Jesus. Do it with Jesus. Do it with Jesus. Do it with Jesus. Do it with my thing. I've been asking God to bless me instead of me be a part of Him, do His work. And you need to say yes to Him. Then why don't you tell that to somebody too today? I'm making a new commitment today to Jesus, to follow Jesus wherever Jesus is leading.